Hi, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics located in Southgate, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey guys, we've loved answering all of your questions so far. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, please send them to us on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast or by email to wheeltalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Ooh wee. We're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it, yeah. <laughs> we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it, yeah. I feel like that's a song. I don't know the song. I don't know it either. We're li- uh, 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 live. <laughs> we're live. Live, live, live. We are live. Um, hi. <laughs> hey Hey <laughs> Uh, how are you, Ryan? I'm doing all right. We got, uh, let's see. We didn't speak since my last show. Had a show a couple weekends ago. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it was my best show in 2021. Oh, yes, your so Berea show. I had, yes, my Berea show. You were there last year. I was. I learned that it's Berea, not Berea. Because yeah. the middle of the United States are fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> so it did not quite meet expectations of last year, but I didn't expect that. Last year but it was did, insane. It did, it did impress me. How it much? It did impress me much. How much? How much? How much? A little over five thousand. Boom. Boosh nagoosh. I was oh and shitty cup lady was there right? I don't. I did not get all the way to the back. Okay. So I did not see, but I think she was. My parents were there. I think shitty cup lady was there. She was such a delight last year. She was so nice. Uh, if she, and we if need... she was not there, would you come in the future and sell or try to? Oh sure, yeah, sure, for sure. But I don't want to go with fifteen dollar cups if she's coming in with twelve dollar cups. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to compete with her. She was doing so good. She like. There's so much pottery there. I know. There's a lot of customer because I'm at the front, so I usually get their first pass. Yeah. And they're like, I'm just making a pass. I'll come back. I'll make my rounds, and I'm like, Yeah, there's plenty of pottery to see. So you know that Tim C. I'm gonna give you a little tidbit, and I think we've talked about this, but Tim C. used to make coins. And be back coins. Be back coins. And I thought that was so brilliant because then you could just stick it in your pocket. And if you felt it, you'd be like, oh, right. I need to go back. And coins are so good, you know, so tangible. Yeah, they're just real tactile. They're yeah. just small. You just like fidget with them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You should definitely make some of those. I could make a slab for you and. and... Uh. Meh. Meh. <laughs> <laughs> Or you could just get wooden coins. Just buy wooden coins. How do you, like, approach... Are you, like, come back and see me? Here's a... Well, when they say, oh, this is my first pass, you say, well, here you go. Um, if you present this, you get 10% off. Hmm. What if they're going to come back anyways? Then great. They got 10% off. Stop being so greedy, Ryan. 5%? 10 10. 10. That's basically tax plus 3%. Just deal with it. Eh. Eh. If you're worried about 10%, raise your prices 10% and then... I'm worried about having to remember to say this and give out like 60 coins. <laughs> and then I get back like 5. And then I'm like, well, how many coins do I need for the weekend? Like 300? 200? You could do it on a business card. You could do a B-back business card. I will be I'm back. Out of those slips, my like thank you slips. I always think I have enough, and I need to print way more. Maybe you should have somebody print them for you. What? Well, I mean, I usually what? go to Staples and get what? like 150 printed, and then I cut them. And no, your wife cuts them, and <laughs> I cut them. Oh, those ones you cut. <laughs> Not the business cards. Rachel does the business. I have plenty cards. of you business can just cards. Order business cards. For the price of Rachel's labor, and <laughs> and the business cards I haven't printed in a long time. I haven't even cut them in a long time. They last a long time because I don't give those out. Yeah, let me tell you, 
I mean, I have them Ryan on my table, but not using, that many people take them. <laughs> Ryan was using a corner cutter for his business cards. Like, he, he rounds two of the corners. And yeah. he was using one that was so fucking old. And I was like, Ryan, just buy a fucking new one. And <laughs> and uh, we finally, like, I think I found one on I Amazon. you ordered it. And I ordered it. <laughs> <laughs> It's hey, it'll just be ran- it'll just be a random time. Like I've already got the business cards cut, and I'll just be like, "Hey, Rachel, can you snap the corners on these?" It literally takes like ten minutes. Yeah. Sure. When you're like sitting there watching Netflix or whatever, it's just like, click, click, click. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So the so show. I was uh, I was yeah. So I was comparing the sales from the last time at like the items. The best selling item was spoon rest. I sold seventy four spoon rest. Shit. I think it's the price like fifteen dollars fifteen bucks yep i sold a little over a thousand bucks in spoon rests that's nuts right i hate you <laughs> fucking spoon rests i'm trying to count i'm i'm i've now that i've started cussing i kind of want to like count how many times that i've cussed in the first Keeping a tally? Keeping a tally. We should... I really do think that, like, if you want a, a drinking game, this... How many times Becca cusses? Every time I cuss, you could drink. <laughs> wow. If you haven't figured it already out already, this is an explicit show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it is. Don't continue if you have children around. <laughs> Unless you want them to hear how the real world talks. Anyway, moving on. Um, so Bria, uh, Rachel got uh, was not with you, and no, uh, my parents came and visited and helped me out. Oh, uh, that was good. Yeah, yeah, and pretty chill. It did rain a lot mm. the first two days. Like it was pouring when I got there to set up. Yeah. It was pouring on Friday. Uh, the, Friday's a little slower, anyways, and. Uh, it was raining the last like three hours of the show. Wow. It was supposed to go till six. We closed at five. Yeah. It was raining from two to five, or three to five. So I like a lot of people just zipped up their tents because like nobody's walking around, and you're trying to protect it so like the wind doesn't gust mm-hmm. in. And it's like, what are you really gonna benefit? I mean, I opened it a couple times and got like a couple spoon rest purchases. So it was minimal, but I like zipped it up and then waited and. I actually napped under my table <laughs> for like 45 minutes. That's hilarious. I laid, I laid on those uh, under the bed bins. Yeah. And, and they have mugs in them, so like they're pretty compact and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I laid most of my back on there, and then I rolled up some padding or something <laughs> and sat it on top of a bin, that like a big bin that my head was resting on, so I was like took a nap. And then I had all that underneath the table. <laughs> With my legs like out from under the table, so it was like darker under the tablecloth. That's hilarious. <laughs> Did you get a good sleep? It was all right. Yeah. Those are the best. It was good. I mean, I've never slept at a show before, so that was kind of different. But... I have. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> we used to go up on the grassy knoll all the time in Leavenworth and take a snooze. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, that that was the main happening the last couple of weeks. And then, yeah, I've just been in uh, throwing mode and then unloaded a bunch of glaze kilns the last couple of days. So Nice. Getting a lot of work. It's I'm feeling more productive. I kind of had a bad couple of months throwing, but yeah, I think that was to be expected because I was finishing a lot of stuff. Yeah. And back to throwing. I enjoy it. It's, it's kind of, and it'll kind of tie into some of what we're talking about today, but yeah. Figuring out what I need to throw, who I need to restock, and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. been the that's been the priority these days. What's new with you? What's going on? Well, I went to Nashville last week. Tuesday. Yeah, how'd that uh, how that fan situation work the out? The fan okay, so here's the here's Oh shit. Here's the it's deal. Like MacGyver the shit out of a fan. <laughs> here's the deal with the fan. So I don't think my fan was hot high and powered enough because it was a battery fan and uh. i probably didn't have enough ice and also um could you have got dry ice uh 
I guess you could. Dry ice seems toxic. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, I made a, I made one of those like redneck fans, but I made it out of cardboard box and um, a cooler liner that I got from a a um, Hello Fresh order. You know, the first yeah. promotional one you get for super cheap, and then. Uh-huh. I put two cans in it, uh, two spin drift cans. Yeah. <laughs> as your as, your exhaust. As my exhaust, and I could have had it a lot like tighter, <laughs> where the fan was. Like it was blowing out cold air, but also when we left, it was 83 degrees, so it was really nice to keep the windows open. And then mm-hmm. we just kept the windows open the whole way, honestly. So the fan would blow into the box, the air would circulate around the cold stuff, and, and then, then it would, would have no place to go but that. But release out the cans. And it did work, but it just wasn't, the fan wasn't strong enough. The car. Where was it sitting in the car? It was sitting in was the back bulky. seat. And also, I should have put the cans like closer together, pointing angular, you know? <laughs> angular. So they were blowing on each of you in each seat? Yeah, and um, that I didn't do, but oh, I learned a lot, and um... <laughs> I, got a, I got a book a few years ago that was called What Would MacGyver Do? And I'm pretty sure there's a, a page or a, a little section about that, making an AC unit when your AC's out. Yeah. And it was some things with pipes and Oh, yeah. Buckets of water and stuff like that. Totally. And so, yeah, if the fan, like I said, the fan could have been stronger. I needed a fan anyway. So it's, it was not a, a wasted purchase, the fan. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I needed one for the studio regardless. But, uh, yeah, no, it was good. And then I finally rode those scooters in Nashville. That was terrifying. Um the like ride bird scooter mm-hmm. things. Yeah, uh, those are. We went on some like back roads. It wasn't really back I've roads. I always it was wanted still... to ride one of those. What? I've always wanted to ride one of those, but I feel like I would only do it in a city that I'm not local to. Well, but you and Rachel, I feel like I'd only want to do it in a local city. You and Rachel should ride on them to the concert tomorrow, and then you mm. could ride back. It'd be easy. I'm always nervous about riding on, like, major streets. No, no, no. You'd be riding on the sidewalk on that one. You're supposed to do that? No, you're not. I feel like you're supposed to ride on the street. Oh. (laughs) No, you're not, but you would. (laughs) I. What is nerve-wracking for me is that you can go pretty fast and, like, you know, you either hit a car or you hit a person. Like, you have to avoid the cars or the persons. Personally, I'd rather avoid a person. Um, Like... (laughs) I'm I'm pretty yeah. If I was in a city like I was, we were in Nashville and I was not familiar with it, so it was kind of nerve wracking. But some right. some people at a hotel cheered me on, so that was nice. And uh, <laughs> and we went to the Lane Motor Museum. That was cool. That was like all I a bunch that. of old weird cars that like were concept cars and stuff like that. It was really cool. So is it named by somebody that just owns all of those cars? I guess so. I don't know. I didn't look into that, but hmm. um, I've never heard of it. It's not. It's it's not like a manufacturer museum. No, it's no. It was just, just like a, a museum name. with a bunch of cool cars, and yeah, it was just a big sweet. warehouse with a bunch of cars parked in it, which was really cool. Um, that was probably the highlight. And then uh, I went with Vegan Joe, and so we hit up some vegan restaurants. Mm-hmm. Uh, did y'all hit like the main strip area and stuff like we that? We did not. We I feel like it's pretty busy there. Um, yeah, we did hit like a side weird side strip, like a fancy side strip, and we found a bar that is at the end, of course, that um you would get a drink and all the games are free. They had skee ball and Donkey Kong and Pac Man and like oh. all the games. Is that like a sixteen bit? Yeah, and like all the games are free. That's awesome. So that was really really cool. It was like something monkey, like arcade monkey, monkey something, ninja monkey, yeah. monkey ninja. I don't know, but um. So the, I always like the barcades; those are fun. Yeah, so that was that was cool. Um, definitely, yeah. Oh, here's something that's super fucking dumb. So we went to I got a I got a sale off of the Graduate Hotels, which typically are like two hundred dollars a night. They're like fancy dancy hotels, mm-hmm. and um, Rachel was the one that. 
uh, introduced them to me and then they had a $30 sale this summer and they were for like middle of the week days and right. in July and a lot of restrictions applied. Right. And so I chose three, two nights, three days. Um, and, uh, I was like, sweet, there's a pool. So turns out the pool, which is really just an oversized bathtub. It was like maybe twice the, it was the same, probably the same size as my mom's swim spa. It was like two hot tubs big, um, was on the roof. <laughs> It's not very big. <laughs> and and I was like, oh, can you, like, swim in the pool? And they're like, oh, it's by reservation only, and it costs $55 for three hours oh to swim gosh. in the hot tub. Uh, uh, yeah, Rachel told me that, and I was like, does that mean there's, like, a drink included or two drinks included? No, there's a bottle of water, a towel, and a chair included and that's so stupid i mean obviously it's supply and demand i'm guessing because it's the size of a bathtub but it's it's for instagram only pretty much pretty is what much. It sounds like. like i yeah fucking insane so the pool actually wasn't owned by the hotel come to f- turn out you know it was owned by the restaurant on the top of the hotel um mm-hmm. so and i'm sure you probably saw pictures from the graduate that showed the pool exactly. and you're like exactly and you're like sweet there's that? a pool and i it looked a lot bigger than it was so they must have used the half zoom or something yeah <laughs> a fish eye <laughs> yeah so that that happened and also on a, on a pottery note i um uh let's see i did mystery boxes last week for little things so i started throwing those today and um and then I did, I finished up my um, cups for my fup date. And I'm having my fup date tomorrow. Your fup date. My nice. fup date. They looked good. I think you showed version one. And then you showed like version two when you added more designs to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I showed it when they were just painted with underglaze. And then- that was green or that was bisque? They were bisque painted with underglaze. And then mm-hmm. I showed glaze painted with stroke and coats. Oh. And then I showed finished. So Okay. So my new process is I bisque, so I sand, then I glaze in the bisque, and then I glaze fire them, and then I sand them again, and then I put stroke and coats on top, and then I yeah. bisque them again. Wow. And all the sanding work doesn't go away, so that's nice. Yeah. Because you... The underglaze gets baked on when you glaze fire it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they look real good, I think, at least, and... Yeah, they look cool. I mean, they're all unique, and it, it's kind of back to the... I feel like that was the most quickly selling style you had when you made yeah. fancy cups. Yeah. Yeah, because they look like, they look like nobody else's, you know. Right. So. Yeah, I hope it goes awesome. How many of the did you sell a good amount of mystery boxes to hold you over and? Yeah, I sold twenty, I think. Nice. So not too shabby, and I'm gonna put about eight pieces in each box. So. Yeah, that's manageable. And I'm just gonna keep them on the website, so. If somebody. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean. You always have to make small stuff anyways, right? Yeah. And I used one of Garrity's rim, like, undercutting tools um, to make, like, wide bowls. It's, they're nice. I want to get yeah. one of his unfooters. His unfooters? Yeah, he's got three new tools out that are unfooters. They. Oh, I think I saw that yeah. on his Instagram. Garrity, if you want to sponsor me. or just... I won't talk bad about you just yet. Oh my god, I would never. He's Never? No. No. Are you kidding oh. me? He's a furniture designer. Becca's got a Becca's got a new company. He's a furniture designer. Like he's like before he was even making clay tools, he was making furniture and I followed him way before. Like I didn't even mm. know he was making clay tools and I followed him for furniture. Wow. I would never. Maybe you need to do a Friday thing with his 
tool that you got. Maybe. Give a little review about it, what you think. <laughs> yeah, no. It's a high bar. I think that it's... I... I, I <laughs> this is so contradictory, but... I feel like it's kind of tacky to talk bad about one, like, well, he's got a full company. Never mind. I think he has other staff. Yeah, he's got staff. It didn't used to be that way, um, but, yeah. But would you feel that way if you talked about a potter's work? I would never. I would not talk about a potter's work unless... Not unsolicited is what you're saying. Yeah, unless I was, like... Yeah. I. I wouldn't say anything publicly about another yeah. potter. I don't think right. I have said things publicly, like badly about other potters. And said their Not name. Not by name, at least. Yeah, I would never yeah. say their name. That's in poor taste. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. I have, I have, however, suggested one person in particular, but I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> I think I was suggested to. I think we had a whole episode about one, but I did not mention the name. So how is so hard? Like I, I think about these people that are just so good, like, uh, you know, like just people that are in the public eye that are always like uplifting to all the people. You know, <laughs> it's like how are you that? Like how can you just? It's so hard. But don't people see through some of that? I don't know. Where they're like, is this real? Is this their real life? Maybe. Or is it... I I do think it's a real thing that some people share only positive stuff on social because there's enough negative stuff that they only want to focus on positive mm -hmm. because putting more positive out is going to be better overall than putting out yeah. negative. I can see that. Yeah. Like, I rarely put out, like, negative political stuff i'm more of a like hey look at this funny video i found <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah okay what is the what would you do if we're gonna yeah we're gonna do a what would you do if okay this is very relevant to what happened to me recently so what would you do if a shelf of raw materials collapses and is all over your studio floor that happened to you recently well, yeah, my shelf fell off the wall, and they have raw materials in there. Oh, right, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> um, that's happened to you twice. Yes. <laughs> I think I'm just pushing my limits too much. <laughs> uh, I'm like, it'll be all right. <laughs> it'll be fine. Um, first of all, put your raw materials on the floor. Uh, and <laughs> uh, I don't know. I if they, I'd throw them away. If they got, like, if they got fucked up, you know? Yeah. I did, the first time I learned to try to move some of them out of paper bags as much as I could, mm. some of them get stored in just paper, like, double papered bags, mm -hmm. and it's just loose. So if it gets wet, it's, like, not great. Yeah, not good. If it gets ripped, it's not great. And then I have a bunch of, like, plastic bags that are zip tied or you know twist tied so those aren't real usually too bad if they fall on the ground but yeah. um i started moving them into plastic tubs and stuff yeah, like that don't that do have glass twist tubs. off lids yeah i've had glass tubs that have fell on the floor in that instance too because we had like those old spaghetti containers and we don't right, use them anymore so you put like you put stuff in them i mean i've used a lot of pickle jars lots of oh. lots of um Lots of pickle jars, lots of artichoke heart jars from the pizza restaurant. Like, Ugh. but they thankfully never fell. Yeah. I would say go plastic if you can. Yeah, try to go plastic. <laughs> like reuse some of those, pla like twist mm -hmm. off ones. I do have a couple that are like snap off ones, but I don't tend to use those a lot because if it gets, it'll pop off. You know, I bet if it fell you could find... Back to, we've always talked about this, but I bet if you went to any deli sandwich place like jimmy john's and was like hey could you start saving your plastic tubs like for mayonnaise or whatever mm -hmm. um they would yeah there's a sub place at the end of the street that i'm thinking of that'd be good i don't really need plastic tubs Dude, now you know the barbecue place would probably have a bunch of shit too 
city barbecue. Oh yeah, they probably would. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, with cleanup. What I did recently, I did have some dry materials that puncture because it was in bags, and then I put them into a plastic tub safely, respirator on just in case it gets in the air and all that shit, and then scooped it up as best I could. My floors are generally clean anyways, but yeah. I would scoop off the loose stuff off the top and then put that into a tub safely without letting it get in the air too much. Yeah. And then, you know, just sponge it. Sponge it up. Luckily, the shelf this time, because it was inside a cabinet, the door stayed shut and it just literally fell forward. Like it rotated oh, like 90 nice. degrees and fell down onto a couple pieces that were sitting on the counter. Yeah, that's good. If there were no pieces on the counter, it would have fell, hit the counter, and then flipped over again. Mm -hmm. But the doors held everything in. Yeah. So all the materials just slid to the front of the doors and hit the doors and then a couple punctured on metal or something inside there. Yeah, but that's easy cleanup. So it wasn't that bad. Yeah. But if it was just loose out everywhere and it just fell, that would have been more cleanup, which I had that happen once, so. Ugh. But. I'm just thinking about when I cleaned up my studio when I left <laughs> cleaning up the glaze room. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> because, like, uh, you have to go, you have to clean those sponges out so quickly because you just wipe at something and it's, like, caked on there and so then you bad. squeeze it in a bucket, but it stays dirty. So, like. Sponge mop. A sponge, sponge mop, mop. That's yeah. the ideal for that. But, yeah. Oof. 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 I think that I have a vacuum that's got a, um. A HEPA. Like a wet vac? A HEPA. No, I've got a HEPA vacuum. A HEPA filter vacuum. Um, oh. And so I'd probably vacuum it up with a respirator, but um, I'd vacuum it up. Uh, yeah. That's the vacuum huh. that's in my closet that I need one tiny part for to work. No. <laughs> got to go to the vacuum, vacuum repair shop. Yeah, well, the one vacuum repair shop I know, he didn't have them, so... I have to really? order it online. We all, Rachel and I always joke because there's a vac, there's a sweeper shop up the street that's vacuum repair. I'm like, they've been in business for years. I'm like, there's no way they're making money. That's got. Oh, we always they joke make that it's money. like money laundering. Because I'm like, no, they make money. There's still old women that have sewing machines. They make money. No, I said vacuum repair shop. Are you sure they're not vacuum and sewing machine repair? Usually the two it go hand sweet. in hand. It's called sweeper shop. Well, the two usually go hand in hand. They fix vacuums and sewing machines? That doesn't sound like a similar thing. It's all mechanics. I mean, I guess so. But anyways, we always joke that it was money laundering because they stay in business. And I'm like, I don't know how. Do you know what I Because nobody's think? buying a vacuum from them. But I mean, I buy vacuums from places like that. But do you know what I think is money laundering? Boost Mobile. <laughs> how many what about cricket and, uh, regard, any of them like they just like have their own stores like in the middle of bumfuck nowhere like like why <laughs> <laughs> i don't understand why phone companies need that many stores like that i don't either i think it's for people that don't understand the mechanics of it and they need to talk to somebody that's tech savvy kind of like a geek squad yeah and that's why they have it mostly because i feel like Maybe it's just a younger generation thing, but I don't want to go to a place like that because I don't want to be sold to. So I'm going to avoid that at all costs. I've gone to them. I've gone to them for sure. So that's like a last resort for me. I'd rather take care of it online if I can. And then if I need to talk to somebody, <gasps> I would call customer service or talk on the like chat or whatever on the internet. And then I would go to a shop. I would not do it <laughs> like first. Do you know what priority. I just realized? Last what? week when we talked or whenever we talked last, I turned off the AC and I left it off. <laughs> Hopefully she got in. So it must have been blistering hot in there the next time she came in. I don't know. Sorry, Rebecca. Actually, sorry, Justin. Uh, who's probably got in here first. Okay, what are we talking about nice. today? 
All right, oh, oh, so oh. we're doing. Before we start, I just wanted to tell you that I had a popsicle and I filled it up with um, almond milk and uh, Thai iced tea, and it mm-hmm. was very delicious. Okay, that's it. Now we can continue. Ooh. Man, that reminds me. I just saw a story from Dante. Shout out Dante from Mud Peddlers, Earth Nation Ceramics. He made a. He had like frozen matcha balls. Like you'd have frozen ice cubes. They were matcha. Usually matcha. I hate matcha. I didn't try it, but he made it look so good. He put these like two matcha ice balls and then he poured almond milk on it and then he put honey and he put cinnamon in there and it like melted and like meshed together. I was like, it looks kind of good. Gross. I also hate matcha. I hate matcha. matcha. It's so like, it's so like bitter or like chalky tasting to me. Gross. Um, but it at least looked kind of good. I'm so sick of like matcha being like popular. Green things in drinks. How do you, how does nobody admit that it tastes like crap? I don't know. Maybe they put it with stuff that makes it taste good. We're we're probably a minority here. Um, I mean, I feel like the people that drink matcha drink it because they know it's healthy for them. They don't drink it because they generally like the taste of it. Right? You never know, Ryan. I don't know. You never know. I'm not going to drink it, but I'm also not going to judge anybody that does. I don't know. I mean, there's people out there that like black coffee, too. I'm like, I can't stand coffee at all, but there's some people that like it, but I feel like they're mainly drinking it for the energy. They're not drinking it for the taste. Oh, no. There's people that like black coffee. I know they like it, but would they drink it if it did? Do people drink decaf black coffee? Yeah. I don't... mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. know. Certain flavors can't get down with. All right. Anyways, we are not answering that list of question because we just did a what would you do if so. Um, Right? Yes. All right. So uh, I wanted to talk about, because it's kind of relevant to where I'm at after a show, but balancing your priorities when you're kind of in a limited time, you're in a time crunch, and how do you balance those with you know if you need to produce work for a show or an update or a shop that's wanting some stuff or wholesale so how do you balance those priorities when you got different avenues you need to sell at well i have a perfect (laughs) hold on keep talking about what you're struggling with right now (laughs) (laughs) okay so i'm not struggling necessarily but i'm at a point where I just did a sale at the the show I did. Luckily, my next show is not for a month since my... Yeah, it's about a month from today. So my next show is in Lexington. It's a two-day show. So that's mainly what I'm doing. I'm kind of in restock mode. Okay. I think I kind of planned it that way a little bit. Genuinely, or generally, I do not do a lot of shows in the month of July just because it's so hot normally. And I feel like I'd much rather focus on the fall yeah. much more. So Okay, this is So luckily I have about a month between and that's kind of where I'm shifting my focus right now is restocking some of those pieces like the spoon rest. This is my Go response. Ahead. Oh, it's coming. Is it going to talk to me? It's on mute. Okay. How do I Damn you, Becca. Flap check, please. Start and make it. Had a breakdown. <laughs> what bon appetit. <laughs> I knew the first part. I heard have a breakdown, bon appetit. He goes, he was like, could you please explain your flapjack, please? Started making it, had a breakdown, bon appetit. <laughs> oh. That's how I feel about what you're talking about. Like, I feel like I just have like a full-fledged breakdown internally. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start <laughs> on something. <laughs> yeah. Because you feel like crippled to like, there's so many options and so many things I need to do. Yeah. Where do I even start that makes it productive or else I'm losing time yeah. working on something that's not priority and not important. Yeah. I feel like now that I'm not working at Gravesco temporarily, uh, potentially temporarily, I... um. I'm like back to this weird state where like I have an un, un I have unlimited time, 
right? Yeah. I sleep a lot, which I'm mm-hmm. grateful for. But You're well rested, Becca. I'm well rested, even though I'm still yawning. I've decided that yawning might be a medical condition for me. Um, and <laughs> okay, just be saying yawning is making me yawn. I won't. No, stop. Because um, <laughs> I'm picturing you yawning. George Washington. <laughs> um, I, uh, and like, okay, so for instance, I had to get all of the stuff done for my update. I'm like out of money. Not really out of money, but... Your FUP date? My FUP date. Um, I'd like to get that FUP date money ASAP, so I had to get that done. And I really wanted to go on this trip, so I went on the trip. And then also I sent out all those bowls um, for my bowls and my my, my um, flash sale bowls. Four of them so far are broken. <laughs> oh, so you got to replace so them. So I got to replace them. I was so bummed. I knew it was going to happen too because like... Were those individual pieces that you sent out that broke no, or was it when you set them six. as a set? Yeah. yeah, and I like mm. shook the boxes and then when I took them to the post office or the UPS, I shook them again and they were like kind of loose and I was... And I should have uh. just taken them back and repacked them. I didn't. I should have. Um, so anyway, my bad. Uh, but it's only four. That's not so too bad. far. Oh, okay. so far. Did you make more than what you ended up shipping out? No. Or did you make exactly what you ship? What well, you made? I did make more, but I glazed them all. So Ugh. I glazed them all because I ended up selling them to another friend. So, oh, okay. um, I'll just make more. It's fine. Whatever. Um, okay. so that is going on then i sold all of these mystery boxes so i have to make all the small stuff now and so it's like mm-hmm. trying to like figure out what to do and when to do it and all the things yeah because it's like and who do i take care of the customer's already paid me money and you know give them better customer service right or do i take care of the people that i can still satisfy that i haven't disappointed yet because of broken stuff right oh and i have the farmer's market and i haven't made a goddamn thing for the farmer's market in four weeks five weeks I literally just keep so you've coming been, back with the same shit. So, so you've been dwindling a little bit of stock each yeah. time. Yeah. So like. Okay. Yeah. But so it's the same as you, you know, like sh- shows and, and like online stuff. And like, when do you, what, I always used to have that issue. Like, what do you make a priority for? Like, what pieces do you make? You know, for you, obviously, right. spoon rests are. A hot commodity so yeah it's like super clear to you what you're well i i think it's up for discussion too because it's all up to you what you want to do but the things for you that don't change the farmer's market you have every thursday you know that's a given yeah that's set in stone that's on the books you have to do that and you need money right so how much can you net from that and what pieces can you make for that that's going to net you a certain amount of money. Right. But then you're also balancing the... I would... Uh, like, if I were in your situation, I would try to get the... I mean, you're completely making the things brand new, too. The the mystery box ones, right? Mm-hmm. Those yeah. are easy. I, I mean, mean you could crank those out, right? It's only so you could satisfy a lot of no, those No, it's orders. 160 pieces. Yeah. So it's not but like you could probably make you could make the bowls for the broken things. Like if I was throwing for the day, I would throw those first. Right. Exactly. Because those people have already paid. So yeah, I'll make. And those. I would make more than I need. I do have two. I have one white one that I'm gonna refire, and then I have another one that I think that will go to the first person that mm-hmm. was broken, and I was so bummed that the second one. I was like, please be green, because that's the color that mm-hmm. I have, and they were blue. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. bummer. But yeah, and like, but I used to always struggle with this, like when I was, you know, doing shows and stuff, like, what do I make? What do I, it's not even I mean, like... you should know what you need to make, right? You know what sells at the farmer's market is more possible to sell at the farmer's market? I feel like it's totally up in the air, you know? Really? Yeah. Fancy cups. Do you keep uh, analytics about what's sold? God like no. if you look Are back you at the whole me? who do you think I am? Okay. Well that's a question to be asked, right? <laughs> I find I feel like the farmers market is more a social outing for me, so it's not like I'm not really stressed about it. You know? No, no, no. Not stressed as 
as in you haven't made anything in four weeks for it, but if you had to think of it business wise, I would probably make some um, mixing bowls. What is the best? Those sold okay. immediately. Like the day that I brought two mixing bowls, they both sold. Okay. And, and then what's your timeline on those? Can you make those as quickly and as efficiently in the the amount of time they take to dry? Yeah, I mean they what's won't the be What's the risk ready for, for loss? This Thursday, but maybe next Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. What do you prioritize? Like, what do you do? You prioritize your shows, your wholesale. Like, what do you prioritize? So right now, I am a little bit behind the game on a wholesale order that are custom mugs. I actually just got, I had to get a stamp for it. So I had to get a rubber stamp mm-hmm. made. They printed the wrong one. It was too big. I had to get them to print another one. I just got, I just got it uh, on Friday. Did they print so, the stamp? Yeah, they printed the stamp. It was a three by three stamp. They should have printed a two by two stamp. I paid for a two by two. So, I mean, that was like a week turnaround. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, I mean, I, like, worked with a company to get the stamp. So, um, that set me back. Plus, I was working with, you know, it was an underglaze pad stamp. Mm -hmm. So, I wasn't sure about the right stage of clay to put it on from the person I talked to, uh, Jody at Goodwill Ceramics. Thanks, Jody. He stamps them at bone dry. And then he bisque fires them. It's going on the bottom of the piece. Yeah. So I was a little bit weary about putting it on at bisque because I was like, well, I could cut down some of the time because I could bisque fire all of these and then they're ready and they're closer to being glazed. But then what's the risk of stamping them at bisque, it not being perfect? Yeah. And then I risk like, what if I mess up the glaze and, you know, I could potentially mess up the stamp. So... So that's my priority right now. I'm trying to get those as far along as I can. So they're in a bisque kiln right now. They're coming down. Mm-hmm. And then my other priority is to get other pieces in the works. So the spoon rests, you know, I threw over three days, you know, I threw a round of 20 spoon rests. And the next, you know, two days later, I threw another 20 or 30. Because I can... I think bat wise, I think I can go up to like forty five spoon rests. Okay. And as long as the clay is Come prepped. On, speedball. Let's get some more bats to him. I mean I've got more than that, but square bats I have forty five square bats. Need more square I don't like throwing them on the round bats because they take up too much space. We need but... more square bats. Ryan needs twenty five <laughs> more square bats. Twenty six, actually. In what color though? Any color. <laughs> I don't think I need more square bats, there you but go. <laughs> I mean, I, I just got some underglaze from him. I'm, I can ask for square bats if I need them, but... I'll ask for you. Um, you'll ask for me? You got a great relationship with yeah. him, right? You got some sway. <laughs> <laughs> My relationship so, uh, is nil. <laughs> so that, that's, that's an easy win, right? You throw them, you come back the next day, you, you know, thumb them mm-hmm. off, stamp them, they're done. Like, you can get... A whole shelf worth of spoon. You can get like a hundred spoon rests done within a week easily. Way more than that if you really wanted to, if you only focused on that. But yeah. I've been doing that and then trying to make sure that I have some other pieces in the works, but not fi- like kind of filling damp boxes, but not overdoing it. So I've been making some other pieces that I can throw and then trim the next day, like oil bottles. I can throw those. I need to restock a lot of those. And then those are easy. You just let them set up and then you thumb off the bottom, Mm -hmm. stamp them, they're done. Let them dry, they're done. Like, those are easy wins for me. So that's what I've been focusing on mainly throwing-wise. And those are more like restocks for my shows. And then, you know, there's there's like one other wholesale, but it's not in a rush. And then I'm making some other forms for another wholesale, but it's really just everyday things that I have anyways. So I'm just restocking for... My own shows as well as the wholesalers but um yeah i know that once these other shows come up i'm gonna sell some more stock like different from what i sold and uh i'm also gonna have some wholesaler that i'm not thinking of right now that's probably gonna reach out to me in the next month yeah that's gonna ask for a bunch of stuff mm-hmm. and 
I'm more of a, uh, like you were saying, you glaze every single piece. I'm more of a stock up bisqueware. So that's where I'm in right now. I, I'm like, I want to restock bisqueware. Yeah. So I can pull from it. And, uh, I'm finally running low on spoon rest bisque wise. I think I've got like 40 left based on what Eric has been glazing and what, um, I've thrown, like I haven't thrown them in a long time. So I kind of went crazy at the beginning of the year and then I hadn't thrown spoon rests in probably like two or three months, like two months. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of the idea. You throw a lot to restock and then it's much easier to just pull glaze, pull pieces off and glaze them. So, I mean, for you, it's a little tougher because you have to be more con conscious of whatever I make I want to sell because you need the income for it, right? At least right yeah, now. Yeah, and I think that that's why I kind of flip it, right? Where I'm starting to sell before I make because then I'm not, mm -hmm. then I'm not wasting my time, you know? Yeah, and you're not, it's not as much up to chance. Right. Um, so I don't have to work as hard to sell it to <laughs> right and but i mean it puts you in a interesting spot because last week you were talking to me or two weeks ago you were like what should i sell so you were trying to dictate what do you think people would buy right now right and then you were going to make to what sold so the customers were dictating what you were going to make it wasn't as strategic in like i'm going to make a cross section of things right. So I have an assortment. Yeah, it was like, what fast flash sale can I do? By the way, I just ordered <laughs> the Garrity Unfoots, <laughs> like, just now, while we were talking. Um, and I got a t-shirt. Anyway. Um, yeah, like, what... I was kind of talking to Joe at Old Forge about that, too, because he does the same sort of thing, where he has people say what they want to make and then he makes them. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a pre-sale essentially. And I think yeah. that pre-sales are really intelligent if you want to work less. Um, <laughs> Is it? I I never wanted to go to the pre-sale route because I was always worried that I would make something expecting a certain number of them to be, to be right and then I would not have them come out right and I have to remake them. That's why I've always stayed away from pre-sales but I could be swayed to yeah, try Yeah, but it. how often do you have failures? I mean... Depends on what it is. I, I was mostly thinking, what of my products could I pre-sale? Like, out of my 61 bowls that I made for the pre-sale for the pasta bowls, one of them was fucked up. Mm-hmm. I feel like I would also get bored if I just was like, hey, I'm going to pre-sale. I'm, you know, 50, 50 black and white oil bottles, yeah. for instance. Like, do I want to be making 50 oil bottles and that be the focus for the next two weeks of my life? I mean... That seems... I don't know. But if but if I got the money in the bank account, I probably would be more swayed to right. like, oh, it's not a big deal. But then it's like, can I make them quick enough so that Erica can come and underglaze them or slip them? Yeah. How quickly can she slip that many... You know, that's where I would kind of factor it in. Like, what's a realistic timeline? Does that mean I'm going to have to drop everything and I'm going to have to underglaze half of them? Right. So, but I think I could play around with it. Like, I'm going to open pre-sale for 15, 15 oil bottles in yellow, for instance. If they don't have, they could just choose their color. Well, I don't want to choose their color because some colors get fucked up. Well, then choose their colors that... Are okay. I'll choose a I'll choose a selection of like two colors yeah. at a time and be like you pick a color and then you pick if you like the clear version or you like the white version. Yeah. Yeah. So technically four options and then I just make let's say fifteen orange and ten yellow and then I I mean I make a few more of each just in case and then I glaze them. I worry that I usually the issues come out when it comes out of the glaze kiln. Right. And then yeah. I'm like, well, I got to remake a bunch of these now. Yeah, I think that that's the, like, you just have to be, that's why mine are only one color and they're very, you know. Yeah, that's where I'm like, do, 
would people buy a pre-sale of basic bitch pots for me? I don't know. You know? They might. That's where I'm like, I feel like I have to have the unique things that people would actually be willing to pay a pre-sale for. But maybe not. Like the textured mugs or carved oil bottles. I feel like the carved oil bottles would be the main one. I don't know. Because I did, I did a custom order for the carved mugs in the past with certain colors. And I've had that experience where I have to make six of them. I end up making about 30 of them yeah. because they messed up. That's that's fucking crazy. And then it's like, I still have some of those seconds in my... Yeah. I know. Thing. You have to be like super sure of a pre-sale. Yeah. That's the thing. Is that it can't be some like fu- fancy f- fucking... can't be something that came out amazing twice and you're like... Yeah. Or once. And you're like, I'm going to do a pre-sale for this. I'm going to make so much money on this. And then it's like... But how much did you actually, like, do this? Right. How much confidence do you have in this? Yeah. I should probably so. do a shitty cup pre-sale soon. I feel like you can never sell enough shitty cups. I'm telling you, I swear to God, they are like, <laughs> they are like. Didn't you do a mystery shitty cup sale or something? No. Like a mystery box shitty cup? No, I or- didn't. What was the last shitty cup sale you did? A while ago. I, um, some lady bought a shitty cup at the farmer's market and her daughter was like looking at him. She's like, wow, these are really cool. I was like, it's fine. You can come back next week. I'll see you next week. And she like, you know, cause she, her mom bought one and sure as shit, the next week they both come back and I was like, oh, hi. And he's, she's like, you told us we'd be back and here we are. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you can't just buy one. It's like a lace potato chip, you know? You can't just... <laughs> you can't just eat one. <laughs> Who the hell opens a bag of chips and just eats one Psychopaths. chip? Psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm usually pretty good about just taking, like, a taste of candy or something, but one potato <laughs> chip? Get out of here. Chip. Get the hell out of uh. here. Wow. Shitty cup date. Uh, Yeah, that's where I'm like... Also, that's kind of a thing for a show that you kind of made a point about. Even if somebody shows a little bit of interest, something like a farmer's market where repeat buyers are kind of... You're going to see the same people week in and week out. You can't really... I would say it's bad for business to negatively interact with someone Mm -hmm. to turn them off because they could be back. They could have interest and you're like... I'll be back and they don't come back and you're like harboring something against them because they didn't actually come back and they said they would. Yeah. It's like they're going to see you in the future. It's not the last interaction you have with this person. For sure. Just like people coming back to a show year after year. Like maybe they saw your booth and they didn't buy something. I didn't feel bad about it because I got plenty of sales and I had a good experience with them. So I'm like planting the seed. For them to see me next year and be like, oh, I got this thing from, yeah, or my sister got this thing from you last year. They got a mug. I've been seeing it. Blah, blah, blah. They really like it. And then they buy something, you know? I was just thinking how funny it would be. <laughs> how funny it would be if somebody emailed you after a show and was like, oh my God, I bought this and I loved it so much. And I'm wondering if you have any more. And I was thinking how funny it would be if you just emailed them back and you were just like, well, sucks for you. <laughs> <laughs> see you next year see you next year um yeah it's true <laughs> i would never do that by the way i just think it no. would be fucking hysterical but i i don't think it's uncommon for i guess maybe early sellers that when they're just getting into it they feel like why do all these people say they love my stuff and they don't buy anything agreed they do love I've your had experience stuff. with other yeah. other peers, but it's like just because they love your stuff doesn't mean they have to buy something. But like I feel like that attitude is not going to benefit you yeah. to have that attitude about customers. For sure. Um, we kind of got off the topic about uh, making stuff. Bal- balancing and making stuff, yeah. <laughs> what about... I jotted this down. You kind of mentioned it before, but 
What about your scheduling of activities that you have there outside of clay? Uh, like your trip. You know, how do those fall into it? Do you support that you should keep those on the books and still do them? Where do you draw a line of, okay, I need to cancel that or reschedule that? No, no, no. Versus, no, no, no. I need to still do that do not for cancel. my own sanity. We do not cancel. What if it's what if it's dinner with friends like two weeks from now? Still don't cancel. Don't cancel. No, it is very important to have a social life, and to have a life outside of clay. And if anything, mm-hmm. that's higher priority than your clay. Because that regenerizes, regenerizes you, re-energizes you, <laughs> re-energizes, regenerizes like you. Like <laughs> to, um, there you go. To be able to make stuff like, okay, so for instance, for instance, I could wake up at 9 a.m., go to the studio, start working, work slow as all get up, like literally a snail's pace, or I could wake up at 10 a.m., putz around my apartment, clean a room, and get to the studio at 4 and do the exact same amount of work that I would have done from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Like, you have to find where your mode, your fast mode is, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. so. That's just understanding and being self-aware about when you're most productive. Yeah, for sure. Like, I'm most productive at night. And it's taken me years and years and years to accept that. It's not even knowing it. It's accepting it. It's saying like, hey, you're not going to get to the studio until 4 p.m. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You might just putz around and do nothing. But the amount of work that I'll get done in the later day, later night, you know, later hours of the night is going to be so much more effective than if I tried to wake up at 9 a.m. and like tried to work all day. That's just not who I am. I would rather work from 4 p.m to 2 a.m. Right. You know? Um, Yeah, I was going to ask you, if you were to add more hours and add, like, more productivity, would you add it right after lunch? Like, 1 to 4, you would add hours? So you go 1 to 7? Or would you go 4 to 10 or 11? I'd probably do 4 to 10 or 11, personally. Yeah. Yeah. Feels just like a lot less work. And, like... That also frees up time if I want to go grocery shopping or whatever. I can go before. Um, mm-hmm. And then I don't have to see people. Like, Yeah, I think some of those kind of trips make it more stressful. Like I have to go. Yeah, I have to go to the grocery. I have to go pick up this thing. And it's during rush hour. And then traffic yeah. has an effect on you. And it takes you twice as long as if you go at that time versus during the middle of the day. When right. People are and working. I think that you also, I mean, you're like that too. I'm sure that when you, on Saturdays, when you get into the studio at 10, you're not as productive as you are at 6 p.m. That's just your... Yeah, I generally don't get into the studio at 10 on a Saturday. Like, if I don't have anything going on, I will do other things. And then do it later. Around the house. So, I, it's not uncommon for me to go out and, like I did this past Saturday, I went to the post office. Yeah drop stuff off at the post office and I came back and I I did my like run or my walk on the way back from the post office because I I'd already done like half of my exercise by walking to the post yeah. office. And then I came back and I was like, "Well, I'm already wearing this outfit to do a run, so let's just do a run real quick." Yeah. Before I even get home, so I don't have a, a risk of like sitting down and then not wanting to do it. So and then I got back and I was like, "Well, it's a nice day. I've always wanted to wash my car." So I never washed my car and I did it. Right. And I was like, it's kind of like a reward for me a little bit, but it's also like housework sort of to do that. Right. Like this morning, I uh, got up at like, oof, I got up late. I've been waking up way too late, personally, like for me. Um, I got up at like 11. And um, that's pretty late. I know. Like, what time do you go to well, sleep? What's been when happening you're up at 11? is um, what's been happening. I usually go to sleep around one or two. What's been happening is I've been having really intense dreams and they make me more tired. So when I mm-hmm. wake up, I wake up at like seven and then I'll go back to sleep and then have another intense dream. And that went, that dream might yeah. like w- be exciting. Like, 
and you'll just like stay in it. Yeah. So like last night's dream, uh, there was like a road blocked, and we were like, uh, <laughs> we were in line to get into the road, and then we got some free shit, and then we were at this concert, and like it was like a whole fucking thing, right? And like my cats yeah. are laying on me. And it's just, you know, anyway, typically I like to wake up around nine. Um, anyway, I got up and I started cleaning, like I cleaned my guest room because you guys are coming over tomorrow so that I can Mm -hmm. put a mattress in there and, um, you know, just did a bunch of shit and like made some food and shit like that. But like, and then went to the studio and I felt relaxed once I got to the studio. I wasn't tired. I wasn't like upset to be there. I was like ready to be there. You know, you feel like you deserved to be right. there. Probably like I had done enough stuff today. Oop, whoops. Sorry. I'd done enough stuff today that like I was ready to get work done. And I think that that mm-hmm. is so much even more important than like, cause like I said, if like at work at Gravesco, if I show up at 9 a.m., I guarantee you I will get out at 6 p.m. If I show up at, at one, like at 1 p.m., and eat lunch and then start at two, I will get out at 6 p.m. Like there is no, the end, the end time doesn't change. <laughs> it's only mm-hmm. the beginning time. And, um, and I think that that's really important within our priority situation, you know, and like the whole, you know, work yourself to death thing. Is that because the time itself, you know, you've set those boundaries on yourself to say, I only have four hours to get done what I need to get done. And you do it. Yeah. It's just like, you know, people that are working a 40 hour a week job, they could probably get that work done in 25 hours, sure. but they're working a 40 hour week. So they're going to make it last 40 hours. I have hours. prioritized myself like when I stopped working at Graves Co. temporarily, I, um... I said to myself, I will not work more than four hours a day. And, and the whole consulting thing is kind of jigged that a little bit, but not, not too much, you know? Yeah. Does it help that you can work from your, you can consult from your own mm-hmm. place? Cause it's like, you can flip a switch, like you're done with that. And then you could clean up for five minutes or whatever. Yeah. It is kind of weird if they're, like, separated out. I have to find shit to do, but, um, Mm -hmm. but it's not that bad, so. Okay. So, the trips and stuff, like, I would definitely not cancel, like, a trip out of town, Mm -mm. like Nashville. If it was something like you were coming to visit me just for the hell of it, that would be something I would be willing to cancel. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be willing to cancel it. And the reason being is that you should, you should, you should like write down I was just talking to somebody about this today it's just clay it's just it's fucking just clay it is just clay like Mm -hmm. if well it's not going anywhere but your bills are coming it's not if you don't have money to pay for them I know but it's not going anywhere it could be there a day later yes if money is involved that's a little bit different like I've definitely told Josh like hey I'm sorry I can't come because gas is too expensive and I can't afford to drive to you, you know? But that's part of the discussion that we're having right now, too. So, yeah. in what situation would you cancel plans or a Probably trip? Probably if, if, well, it's, I always have enough money. It's just, because I don't live paycheck to paycheck. I live a month ahead. So, I pretty much always have money. So, I'm not really. Right. It's mostly me being cheap. That's that's okay. when it it's not because of work you know okay so i feel like you'd be would you be more likely to cancel something week yes. of versus i'm forecasting that i'm going to need this weekend yeah i'd cancel it after like the day this of, show yeah. or after this update that i need to yeah. make more stuff yeah like you just came back from a trip so i feel like this week is kind of like off limits like you can't be adding new stuff to this week necessarily you guys are coming that are like well yeah but you knew about that for a couple i weeks. also feel like if you're gonna schedule in a trip it should be like not like a paid vacation but you shouldn't have to if you can get away with it you shouldn't have to make up for that time it should just go back to normal like 
<laughs> like you shouldn't have to like okay i'm gonna make a whole bunch of stuff because i'm gonna be leaving and then i gotta make a whole bunch of stuff because i'm back. right like why aren't we and why aren't we days. prioritizing having a normal schedule that like allows for maybe two days off three days off and then you come back and you just pick up right back where you were you know like a regular fucking job like yeah we need that needs to happen <laughs> the work doesn't keep piling on because you're gone. right it shouldn't it shouldn't and if it does then something something is off you know i would say something's off I mean, I, yeah, I, I mean, I like think you should a have a business time. that's flexible enough that you can take a couple of days off and it's not going to hurt anything. Right. Like if somebody gets a pot a day late, unless it's like, God forbid, for Thanksgiving dinner, you know, and you're up to the wire, like who fucking cares? Like it's pottery. We're not like we're not saving the world with <laughs> with yeah. bowls. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I think. uh for me, it's really important to, if I mention a deadline, Ooh, that is true. then I keep to a deadline. Mm -hmm. I, the whole, Hey, I'm, I'm just going to ship that out two or three days later yeah. is not fine with me. That is not fine, but that goes in, that goes in line with scheduling out your time accordingly, you know? Yeah. You have to be aware of how much time it realistically takes you yeah. building a buffer just in case shit happens or you go on a trip or it, cause you should know that some things are going to happen regardless. Yeah. You can't expect every single thing to come out perfectly. Right. And it, so, for sure, for sure. For and that. I've, I've definitely oh, no. had like catastrophes where I'm like, yo, the entire firing, I have to refire it. It's going to be a couple days late, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And that's always fine. Usually, you know, yeah. but like, as long as you're not a habitual excuse maker, I right. think people understand. But I like, I try and plan my life out accordingly, you know? And like, it's funny that like now that I'm older, um, it, like in my mid to early twenties, I would push everything to like the very end and be like right last minute. And, and I see that a lot in young, the younger potters that I currently know. And it is, it's like something that I can't handle anymore. It's just like, what are you pushing? Like you set a date on the calendar of a restock and you're like, okay, I expect everything to fall in line with this. And then you also have a show two weeks later. So you wait until after the restock to make the stuff for the show. Kind of. Yeah. Or like just like of? you're making, 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 and then the whole you know, like three days before your show, you're firing like 24 seven, you know, like just trying to get it out like the morning of. And that would be terrible if some something messed up. And I, I was I never want to be like, sorry, I can't make it to this show because shit happened and I didn't have any. Stock. Right. It's like that is unacceptable <laughs> for me. No. Yeah. Agreed. And I think that I pushed myself. But I uh, like when I was younger to do that a lot. And now that I'm older, I'm like, I got to I got to like figure this shit out, <laughs> you know? And honestly, from a customer perspective, from a business perspective, like nobody gives a shit whether you show up or not. Like it's up to you to, to up, figure yeah. that stuff out Yeah, for sure to show up to like be there. It, you know, if you say you're going to be there, yeah. I get stuff happens. Like if there's a death in the family or some like something outrageous happens or yeah. You get sick at the last minute or something, but it shouldn't be because you don't have work at a show. Right. Or yeah. that's where you plan accordingly with what shows you want to do so that you can realistically meet those yeah. expectations and like, of what's on your calendar. Don't get me wrong. Like I'll push it still, but it's still a very scheduled out system. And I think that Leavenworth really helped me with that. Um, prioritizing the time and the pieces that I had because I did have such a small window to do things in. So I figured out really quickly what I could do in that small amount of time, you know? So like, oh, we've talked about it before, but I'll do a quick rundown of how I used to do Leavenworth. Um, I would get home on, on what, what was the schedule of Leavenworth by the way? And how long was the Leaven Leavenworth was May to year. October, Friday through Sunday. They did have Thursdays, but I never did Thursdays. Um, 
every single week, May to October. October, Friday through Saturday, Sunday. So I'd get home Sunday night, and typically I'd either make a hundred things Sunday night or a hundred fifty to a hundred things Monday, and then I would bisque them on Tuesday, and I would um, get them out probably Wednesday, and then on Wednesday. I would glaze them, and then Wednesday night I'd fire them, and then I'd unload them on Friday morning at 4 a.m. And so that was my schedule every single week. And if I didn't, if I was... Because you had to drive two or two and a half hours to Leavenworth. It was an hour and a half, but yes. It, for the for show, the show on, Friday. on Friday. And I had to be there at 7 a.m. And if I didn't hit it, I didn't have any work for that week, like you know, that wasn't new. Like I didn't have anything to replenish and it really taught me what was important and how my time management worked and how, like how I had to do things. And I don't think, cause you're not in a, I feel like you're not in a good strategic, you're not making strategic business decisions when that's your schedule. You have to do it to meet the demand. Like, yeah to meet the demand of you have to show up on Saturday or Friday, but like you, there's no leeway. There's no room for experimentation. There's no like, let me try this. No, you literally just have to be like a robot to do what has to be done so that you can show up with right. Like what works and do what works and that's it. And that even though it was super stressful and probably very like, uh, like, hurtful to me <laughs> physically <laughs> and mentally detrimental, yeah, detrimental yeah. to me it was a super great learning experience because uh, now if somebody says hey i need something in a week not a problem like i can get you know the possibilities finish, no worries and guess what that doesn't even take up my whole day like i can still do that in four hours a day probably less you know and because of that whole experience, I don't have an issue with prioritizing what I do. Be just, it's just like how lo- second nature. How long did you go through that schedule at the Leavenworth? Did you do that for two or three two years straight? Years. Or did you do that for like a three and a half and years? Half, you Two and a half, you lived by that yeah. schedule? 2014. Yeah. That's nuts. It was more than two and a half years. I feel like you were, you got it to a stage the last year or so that you were making bisque ware to get ready. I would make 800 pieces before, yeah. Before, before May. Before May. Um, but that would only hold you over, like, timing wise for maybe a month until you would, had to yeah, start that living on that schedule. Yeah, that would just fill up my booth. Like, yeah. So I think that actually I did it from 2004. So the the pieces you were making every week wasn't your only stock, was it? It sounded like you had eight hundred pieces to, but you wouldn't have eight hundred pieces out at a show on in May. You would have about two hundred fifty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but also you have to remember that also I was doing wholesale at that time too. I would do wholesale orders as well. Okay. Yeah. So I was firing in other times too. I just wasn't, you know. Yeah, but that was more for wholesale stuff, not eleven. I think stock. that it was two thousand and fourteen to two thousand eighteen or nineteen. Really, I want to say it was four years. So did you did you like that grind and that I hustle that it. you had to do, or did you prefer the October to May timeline when you were you didn't have that? No, I loved it. You love it. I like okay. a good schedule. Yeah. Do you think some people just need that? I do. They need to take the thinking out of it, and they, they just need to make... I do. If it sells well, I think that they do need that. Like, if if something just s- sells like hotcakes, I think that some people super thrive under that, you know? Where it's just like, eh, you got to make the same thing this week. Go for it, you know? Yeah. Is that a matter of... How much do you have to like it versus? Well, I think you can get joy from making it or you can get joy from getting something done and accomplished in a week, you know? Uh-huh. 
I mean, I think it. I think you can get a sense of accomplishment making something that goes out the door at oh, the end of the. For sure. You know, when you get it complete, you know it has a home mm-hmm. to go to, and that that burden of is it going to sell and all that. You know, what do I need to take to this show? Because I'm not sure if it's going to sell or not. Right. Those kind of questions subside because you have a good confidence level that what you take is going to sell or you're going to be happy with, you know, you have the right expectations yeah. going into it. So, I have to make my cousin's that definitely feels a wedding good too. gift. My second cousin, I got to make her a wedding gift. Okay. Oh I had another question. What's that? What about... Okay, let's say you got all this stuff going on. Not the love and work situation, right. but let's say right now, whatever. You're doing your fuck day. Okay. You're making stuff. You got shows going on. What about some new opportunity that comes your way? How do you... Do you have plans to be able to accommodate that? Like a whole... Let's say it's a wholesaler that comes to you. Never talked to you before. They say, hey, I'm interested in this. Uh, you know, at what stage do you um, have those discussions and talk through it with them and, you know, open that door to actually potentially work together versus I'm too busy. I have too much on my plate. I can't do that. Well, and that's you, interesting. You know, shut that that down. is a good question. Now that I've like... Because I think those situations come up. Yeah. Because a lot of the you can't plan for. No, 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 you can't plan for that stuff. And yeah, I mean, like, that is a great question. Especially around shows. Like, I had the Berea show. I had a, I had a client that came to me that was like, "Hey, I have this shop, and I'm looking for wholesale oil bottles. Do you wholesale these?" And I was like, "Yes, I'd be willing to wholesale them." And we exchanged cards and just talked about what they were mm-hmm. looking for. And. It was about, like, you know, what were they looking for? Did they have flexibility? So I was totally open to it, and I think I can accommodate it. I would have to kind of make the pieces to um, fulfill it. I wouldn't have enough stock to fulfill it from my current right. stock. So, But I did need to restock oil bottles anyway. So, And I had that time period of, you know, I don't have a show two weeks from now that making 30 oil bottles is going to take time away from those. Yeah. So... You know, those situations come up and I have that discussion and I'm like, can I do it? Can I not do it? I think that now that I've got like, uh, now that I have a set plan for my life and what money I want, it would definitely be an interesting conversation because sometimes wholesalers can come to you and then they end up taking over your whole life, you know? Because of their demands and their expectations? like, you know... Something that looks like a really great opportunity may actually be horrible. Detrimental. Yeah, like detrimental (laughs) to your business and your health. And so I think that I'd have to, if somebody came to me and was like, hey, looking for 100 pieces a month. uh, Oh, my God. I'm looking, no, I'm looking for 100. Yeah. Uh, small. I feel like that's not a common thing to, <laughs> to have a wholesaler that's like, I want a hundred pieces a month. Can you fit me in? Really? A hundred pieces a month from a wholesaler? You're not. Not, not any you're that not I've talked to. The to. Right wholesalers. <laughs> okay, we'll okay. change it. Okay, hey, I want a hundred pieces. Let's say, um, one hundred and fifty pieces a quarter. Okay, one hundred and fifty pieces a quarter. Okay, that's reasonable. I feel like. That's more realistic. Okay. I mean, I usually get orders for like 40 pieces, you know, every couple of months or something. When I was working with the plant store with Urban Sprouts, it was like a, it was probably like. A th- I think that was also the money part of it, like the cost of your items and they wanted to take advantage. No, no, no. It was like a, it was like a, a certain amount of money. $1,500 order every month, like every other month. Whew. Like, you yeah. know, they were not. They were not lacking in sales. So, anyway. Okay. Um, okay, 150 pieces a quarter. We'll say they're small pieces. Okay? Like, one of the something mm-hmm. I could do with one of those unfoot ribs or whatever that Garrity has. Um, so, uh... Is it in your current product line, or is it something that is within your capabilities? Current product line, easy, easy peasy. Right? 
Okay. And I said, I want 150 pieces. In. I would say absolutely. I'd probably not give them a wholesale price. I'd probably just sell them for what I'm selling them for now. So, or maybe like seven bucks a pop or something like that, you know? But, um... Well, they would know what they sell for because they're seeing you. Let's say they're seeing you at a show and they're looking at your prices at a show and they're talking to you at seven dollars. My wholesale price is seven dollars. They retail for ten. Okay. 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 So gotcha. Um, they can take it or leave it, but let's say they took it. So seven bucks, one hundred and fifty pieces. What's the math? Math it up. Uh, seven. Seven. T- Low over a thousand bucks. Okay, so seven bucks times one hundred and fifty is ten fifty. Ten fifty. So um, I get a thousand dollars fifty, and I know that those hundred pieces I could probably get done in a week. Hundred fifty pieces probably get done in a week to a week and a half. This is me, right? Yeah. So I know these are like pinch pots or something right, small something like that tiny. that you can crank out. Yeah. So yeah. I know it's not going to take a ton of time, a ton of my time to do them, right? And I'm still gonna get a good mm-hmm. price, thousand bucks. I need to make four thousand dollars a month. <coughs> that means I can lessen my shitty cup sales, right? That's a that's a whole week. That if you need four thousand a month. Yeah, that's a week. That's a whole week of work. That's a week of work. That is worth it to me. If somebody came to me and said, "Hey, I need a hundred mugs, hundred mugs every two months." Not a chance. Not a fucking chance. No. Is that mainly based on the enjoyment level yes. of you making that item? And okay. and the amount of time that it takes to, to, takes to make handles, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, like loss there is with handles, the um, yeah, just that. The glazing process is probably a little more taxing. Not really, but little... like. It's just the handles, you know? Like, if they were like, hey, mm-hmm. uh, let's say, so my mug price would be, what, 20 bucks for a wholesale? $20 times 100 every two months, that's 2000 bucks. 2000 right? Every two months. No fucking way. That is the same amount of money as... 2000 bucks. yeah. That's that's double the money. Oh, you said every two, every months. two yeah, months. Yeah, so 1000 bucks a month, but you've got to make... 50 mugs a month on average no i don't want to do that i can make would you 50 rather make mugs. 50 mugs or would you rather rather make 150 pinch pots? i would rather do 100 pinch pots a month than make 50 if, than make 100 p- mugs 100 100 pinch pots a month than make 100 mugs every two months oh definitely i would much rather make 100 shot and i'm making a month. way yeah. less money on that set stuff you know um uh, but that's because it's bigger there's more space. It takes more space. It takes more firing time um, because of the space. Uh, it takes... I mean, you can make excess easily. You can make 125 or 120. And if you lose a couple, who cares? You're making so many of them. Yeah. If you lose a mug, it's like... Uh, I know, will admit that glazing a little tighter the pinch pots you... is a pain in the ass. But regardless, like glazing the mugs is a lot easier. But regardless of that... I think that like I would say no. Is it is it also we get kind of money happy when we hear those kind of opportunities where you're like I'm looking for this frequency? Oh yeah. And you're getting excited. You know, this oil bottle one for instance, they came up and they were like we're looking to get these you know, these these gift boxes that have olive oil and they have a handmade bottle. Right. We used to get them made by this person. We can't find them because there's just not enough out there. And, How many did they say? Uh, the first order is for 25. And did so. they say about how many they would order? No, I mean, the first order is 25. They said they were going to, they're working with a, um, I think they're working with a medical something or another that they give them as gifts to their employees. Okay. So they're, they're good with flexible on the colors. They're like, I don't care. Give me a cross section of different colors on different clay. Right, so, but they didn't say like, how many they were working with in the past. Like how many the potter made for them before. No. Okay. But I don't really care. I mean, it gets me to my minimum. It starts the relationship. Yeah. It's something achievable that I can, I can meet the timeline. 
I can deliver them. And I don't see myself like wanting to get rid of making oil bottles in the future. So that's something I don't mind making. Yeah. I can turn them around quickly, kind of like I mentioned earlier. So, you know, and then does it open that opportunity up with them? They're making gift boxes, right? But they also have soaps and whatnot. Do I open up the opportunity to give, you know, wholesale spoon rests or wholesale, you know, similar to spoon yeah. rests, but they're like soap dishes that are round. And it's like, you know, that's an option. And, uh, you know, I, I think I would be a little more weary of making like 60 or 80 s spoon rests or soap dishes. Cause that would put a pretty big hit in my inventory to, to give that many yeah. because it's like six bucks a piece, but I have a pretty good confidence that spoon rests are going to sell. Do I really want to sell that many? Okay. Here's, here's a question. What if somebody came to you and said, I want, and this has happened by the way, two people that we know <laughs> um <laughs> i'm thinking about i want to order a thousand small planters and this will be a quarterly thing can you do that a thousand a thousand planters in a quarter mm -hmm. i would personally say no because i have many i like my toes in many different pools and I know that that would suck the life out of me to have to shift my business mm -hmm. for this one customer. Like, th the diversification keeps me more sane. I feel like there's way more risk in relying on one customer. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like the enjoyment would suck it out of me. I I do this on the side, so enjoyment has right, to be for sure. important for me. I, it's interesting because um, I... I I feel like that proposition a thousand of any pieces in a quarter is like quote unquote a dream, you know? It's like no oh way. my god, that sounds terrible. Or well like I could make so to much me. money because this is a consistent thing. They're promising it every quarter. What even if it was 500 pieces a quarter, whatever. Like, it just... I feel like I'd go crazy if I even did a mug club of 400 <laughs> mugs in a year. Like, that sounds horrible to okay, me. Okay, but let's assume that like, you liked throwing the same thing over and over again. Like, let's assume that it's not your full-time gig. It's not your part-time gig. It's a full-time gig, and you have to put food on the table for your, like, 12 children. Family. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, that seems like a really solid, stable thing. And I think that especially at the beginning, you're like, when that proposition arises, it's like, fuck yeah, this is great. It t yeah, it takes the it takes the unknown out of yeah. it, right? It it almost guarantees you income. This is great. But I think you need to, for me, I'm aware enough that I need to look at myself nine months down the road and say, am I going to be enjoying doing this after I've done it? Right. A quarter, two quarters at a time. Like, do I foresee myself being happy? Right. And also what you need to do is really observe the customer that is approaching you and see how many times they change their mind about small things. Right. Because let's say, let's say you're like, heck yeah, let's fucking do it. And then they're like, okay, great. Um, you know, this white is okay, but I was thinking that it might be better if it was more of a tan. And also, could we <laughs> change the shape a little bit to this? And um, and also this and this and this, right? <laughs> that are we are we having an experience that we had we talked about about ten episodes ago ish? No, I mean like yeah, I mean okay. First of all. Uh, Rebecca deals with a lot of wholesale clients just generally. So that's just the nature right. of her business. If you were thinking about that. Right. And I wasn't actually necessarily thinking about that. I was more thinking about how, when I did the deal with Starbucks and how they just continuously changed their mind. And it was so mm -hmm. frustrating and it, I ended up losing money in the end. And yeah, 
Because you feel like they have the leverage, right? right. You're you're grateful, you're to, grateful them, to them. You're grateful to them. So you have to adjust. Right. And I think that it's really important to when them. we get faced with opportunities like this to to take a really take a step back, look at the situation, and if you need to make a contract, you know, establish boundaries and make sure that you are going to actually make money. Because remember, if you're making tens of thousands of things or a thousand of things and you knock your prices in half you're not making money right yeah i I would feel yeah because it's i feel like it's very common as you start doing wholesale that you undervalue you underprice stuff sometimes we've all done it because you're just getting into it you're like yeah i can make money at half the price like that's going to be a thousand dollars i'm I'm going to be happy with that but then you find out like Oh, maybe I was underpriced originally. Right. And then you're like, well, if I can make it and sell it at half the price, you know, is it still viable for me? And what did I get myself into? Because then you have to have those discussions with them about like, well, I raised my prices. I, I made a mistake. I realized that I was under underpricing mm-hmm. my stuff. And then, you know, it seems a little bit like, you know, what kind of wholesaler are you working with? Are they going to be open right. to that? Are they not? Very rarely do you get a, a wholesaler that is super cool. <laughs> Very rarely. Like a super, super yeah. fucking cool one. Like Jen from Urban Sprouts. I could have gone up to her and been like, I messed this up. I need to raise the price $2. And she would have been like, that's fine. You know? that There's not a lot of people you can do that to. And... Mm-hmm. Probably depends on who you're yeah, selling to as well. Depends. Like she's a small yeah. business owner too, so she probably yeah, understands usually it. Usually you can you can get away with it with like smaller people, but they expect you to know what you're doing. So they want it to be like definite. Mm-hmm. And then the bigger clients are probably more bottom line. You know, this is what we agreed on. This is the price we agreed on. This is how much we're gonna get. As the as their business, they're like, this is the profit potential on these yeah. pieces that we're gonna sell. This is the risk we're taking. You know what I found and out when I was working with Starbucks is they don't know shit. They're just like us. They're just regular people working in a large company, and they're mm-hmm. it's like a bunch of people that are working as a team that collectively don't know anything. They're just <laughs> like, oh, can you do that? <laughs> Sure. Okay, let's do this. Oh, wait, we changed our mind. Can we do this? <laughs> like, they don't... <laughs> they're just individuals. Yeah. Y- you think of them as Starbucks, but they're, they're really just humans, individuals. Harry is over there ordering the cups. There's nobody, you know, <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, there's not a team that is overseeing Carrie and yeah. sending them out, like, here is your playbook of what you need to do, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> and here's how you handle these different situations should they come up yeah it's more like these things come up and then they're like well let me think about that and let me ask they're shooting you know. in the dark just like you and <laughs> but like yeah it's it's very interesting how we think that they're like higher than us and they are definitely not um some of them are like you know if it was like uh Abrac- not Abercrombie um I don't know Urban Outfitters, something like that. Are you thinking like anthropology? anthropology is that that's what you're what thinking? Of? thinking of. Anthropology, <laughs> Urban Outfitters, those people would know what the fuck they're doing. But even then, like, um, oh, it was Heidi. Heidi had a on Boldly the podcast that Heidi did. She had somebody mm-hmm. on her podcast, and she was talking about the uh, uh, the wholesale. She had a wholesale with Anthropology, I believe, and yeah. And it was, and she just wasn't ready. Yeah. Yeah, I think those, uh, I think those situations always come up. I mean, I've only had my own lived experience, right. but when you're in business long enough, especially when you go to certain shows, there are people roaming those shows mm-hmm. that have shops. They're looking for handmade. They're looking for unique. They're looking for something to please their customers. And it's not out of the question that you get inquiries at shows. Don't feel like you have to commit to something right then and there because you've got things to focus on that weekend. So exchange cards 
you know, set reminders to follow up with yeah, them. Yeah, shoot if them you an email said you follow up with them. Yeah, I actually ended up getting a call from them. They called me like three days later and actually followed up and talked about it. So I did have the, you know, I figured out what I wanted to talk to them about. I just had a reminder to, you know, email them, but I did not yeah. yet before they called me. So I knew what answers to to come back with when we did talk. So, you know, we just talked about it over the phone. We agreed on how many timeline and, uh, you know, how we're going to end up delivering them or picking them up and stuff like that. So it, it wasn't overwhelming yeah. for me, but it can be overwhelming at a show because you're in the groove of selling and then you get somebody that comes up to you and asks you these kind of questions about wholesale or, you know, they have a shop and they would love to consign your stuff. They think it, you know, those kind of questions come up too. And it's like, eh, you know, what's the risk here? Consignment's a little more risky because you're not getting money until after it's sold. Yeah. So that one is definitely lower on the priority list. We didn't really talk about that today, but consignment would definitely be lower on the list because I feel like you should focus on making things that you're getting the most money out of mm -hmm. off the bat, like selling things, that you can get 100% cut of or mostly 100% cut of minus like processing fees or whatever. So, you know, if you have a chance to sell one-to-one -one with a customer, that's what you should be prioritizing personally, unless you committed to a wholesale timeline and you need to get those out too. But, um, yeah, that's kind of how I prioritize it. We didn't even really mention consignment, but, I'll definitely be open with my consignment shops. If they're asking for restock, I'll, you know, let them know, hey, this is kind of where I'm looking yeah. at. I usually don't even commit to a date on consignment restocking. I'll just be like, you know, thanks, I'll make them. I'll be in the process of making them, and then I'll restock them. It could be two months later. I don't know. It. I'm not in a rush necessarily because hopefully they have enough stock that they're not desperate for it. And you can also get ahead of it too i think we didn't really talk about this but you could also reach out to some of those people mm. to try to get it in the works like i reached out to an old wholesale client that bought something back in uh april yeah. in anticipation for spring and i reached out to him it was just informal through instagram we've talked through instagram that's kind of how we connected initially and i was just like hey just reaching out let me know if you want some more wholesale shot glasses I'm kind of in the making mode, and uh, I'd love to restock some for you if you're interested. So just making that contact, and then she was like, yeah, I'm interested. I'm looking for some more. I'm looking for like 40 more or 50 more or whatever, and then just give me a mixture. Mm -hmm. And August, September is good. I'm not in a rush. So like those are the best. If you can have plenty of time and you're reaching out to them, you know, you're kind of building a backlog of money that's going to be coming to you later in the year if you could plan it accordingly, like reaching out to wholesalers. So it's not so surprising when they do reach out to you. Plus it gives them more time to like, think about what they would want. Yeah, for sure. I accidentally just stopped the recording on my computer and then I just started it up again. Thankfully I wasn't talking. Okay. <laughs> That's good. It should be interesting. <laughs> linking that up. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to like clap or something simultaneously? That would so be it's great like, if we could it? clap on 45 or. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> okay. That's what we got going people. <laughs> do you do that? Did you ever do that in the past? Like reach out to wholesalers or just getting ahead of it a little bit? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I mean, I think it's. I think you can expect that once you're getting to Christmas time, they're going to be reaching out to you regardless. Yeah. So I I don't think it's uncommon to hear contact or make contact Ooh. with them in August, September, I, you know, I or do think mid summer to be like, Hey, when are you going to need or what that you is true. For the I winter? do think that now is the time to start Christmas stuff. Now is the time. And sounds crazy and but yeah maybe on the point of that reaching out to your customers and saying hey time to start ordering christmas time stuff um my cutoff is this like heidi cuts her she has a cutoff date she's like hey last date to order anything for christmas is november 12th or something shit some shit like that are you talking like pre-orders or you're talking just 
I'm going to have stuff in the shop. If wholesale. You want, oh, wholesale. Or like anything. Yeah. Just like wholesale or big orders, consignment, anything like that. Hey, like send out an email and be like, hey. Because it, yeah, at that time of year, you need to be focusing on the mm-hmm. stuff that you could sell directly yeah. to customers so you can make as much profit mm-hmm. on those items yeah. and not working your ass off to get 50%. Yeah. And you're fulfilling a wholesaler that needs to sell to their customers. So, like, I feel like you're on even more of a time crunch. Because they're like, we would love it by late October. And you're like, you didn't reach out to me until September. No, thanks. Or we didn't talk until late September. And they want 100, let's say 100 pieces or 150 pieces or something. You know, can you fit that in your schedule? But also... You know, you have a pretty good possibility that certain items are going to sell. Be like, maybe I can't do the whole order, but I can give you a bunch of mugs and a bunch of bowls, right. for instance. Yeah. We should probably stop. This was supposed so. to be a short episode. Yeah, we're getting getting a little late here. It's 1223. All right. Any last words, Becca? Uh, No. <laughs> all right good luck everybody. good luck out there uh, <laughs> in the real world yeah I, f- I feel like just ultimately just being aware of like what your needs are what your timelines yeah. are what you're willing to do what you can handle take it a- to not overwhelm yourself i think that's that's going to serve you well i also for the long term. i do have one last thing uh find a friend that you like a business friend that you have like for me it was andrew S- have a sit down and Talk about what you can do realistically. That's my advice. Like what you can do realistically and then plan. Because we always we always make it seem faster than or slower than what we can do, you know? So mm-hmm. like And like, you know, scheduling things like restocks and putting those on the calendar and being more proactive than yeah. reactive. I've decided not to do that ever. I I just never prioritize restocks online. It's it, it, probably because I don't sell yeah, the, yeah, yeah. sell Same. out or anything. So there's not a Same. pressure. It's like like uh, my my little fup date tomorrow. I gave him one day. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> like, it just doesn't make any sense to. I should have put should have like released that video that I did tomorrow and just been like, they're up. What I really want to do someday is just be like, just put them all up and just be like, they're online. Have fun. Yeah. And then I think the the go-to is after that, just mentioning it a few times will get people, like, to know it's there. I feel like it's, like, some some people are just not on Instagram for a couple days, so they just completely miss that you did an update. So I feel like that's where the hype does help. It's not like you're trying to sell them for a week straight, but it's like, hey, this is happening. In case you didn't know, this is happening. Hey, it's, it's happened. happened. Get in there if you want it. Yep. Okay. So. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yo, yo, higgity, yo. It's Becca here. Hey, just so you know, thank you for listening. And also, we have... What do we have again? A Patreon. A Patreon. We have a Patreon that you should go and if you want to donate to you could donate to it if you don't that's cool too but i'm um, just google wheel talk podcast patreon don't do the other one uh because there is a wheel talk on patreon but it's not us so make sure you get the right one it's and in it's in the show notes and also um leave us a review because they're fun to read okay bye